Listeners, <clears throat> today we will review by considering considering the phrase life is something which can can be developed and then that the highest life is one which is peaceful and useful ordinary life is made up of three things body mind and the thing they call self which is something people think up on their own the sublime or most excellent life however is made up of only two things body and mind there isn't any of that thing they call self or selfishness remaining if we have trouble understanding the meaning <clears throat> of the word self then we can speak instead of avicca or ignorance not knowing wrong knowing we can say this because the self arises from ignorance or ignorance is the cause of self therefore the excellent life is one in which there is just body and mind without any ignorance the mind is purified of ignorance when there is no ignorance then there is vicha or right knowing correct knowing when there is no ignorance then there is the knowledge that everything is not self instead of the illusion of self there is the correct understanding of not self and then life is freed of all problems the ordinary undeveloped life sees everything through the eyes of ignorance with ignorance or avicca but the life which has has been developed sees everything according to vicha correct correct knowing because of this ignorance all forms of self and selfishness are born ignorance is the cause of the misunderstanding that there is self that we are selves when there is any kind of feeling um, or emotion and ignorance is in charge then there arise all kinds of thoughts desires wills intentions and actions and out of this there arises the idea that if all these things are going on there must be someone who does it if there are these activities then there must be an actor the one who does these actions and so out of this ignorance is born the self the illusion of self you need to study for yourself until you realize within yourself that this thing called self always arises after the action after any feeling that the self always arises after 
a feeling or an emotion. These feelings and emotions and thoughts and everything else come before the sense of self. We need to examine this carefully within our own experience until we realize that then this self is in some constantly existing thing. It's just an illusion created out of the mind, created by the mind due to ignorance. If we watch carefully, then we see that the actor comes after the action. This illusion of an actor comes after the action. If we realize this within our own experience, then then we have the chance to uproot this ignorance. If you tell this to a little kid, they won't believe you. If you say that the actor comes after the action, they won't believe that it goes against the child's logic. So we must try to explain this to the children, how the illusion of the the actor, the one who acts or does, comes after the action or activity. If we do this, if we can actually help the child to understand this, then we ourselves will benefit also because we will have understood it more clearly ourselves. There are many ways to observe this. We can observe it in, for example, when we, there's, we have a nervous system. And when the nervous system is stimulated or excited by some visual object, then there arises the activity we call seeing. There's this natural activity of seeing. But then because of ignorance, we always interpret it to be, I see, I am seeing. The same happens. But if if we observe this more and more, we see that this I, this me that sees, is a concept created by the mind. It's merely an illusion that doesn't have any reality in itself. There isn't any real self that exists there. There's just this, all that exists is a concept created due to the mind's ignorance. We can observe the workings of the nervous system, seeing, hearing, smelling, and so on. And we will see that the, the self, the concept of I, of me, is an illusion created after the fact. Children might ask, well then is this nervous system, is it the self, or does it have a self? And we must reply to them, of course not. The nervous system is neither a self, nor does it have a self. It's just a natural system that functions naturally according to natural laws. It neither is a self, nor has a self. Or we can take the, the ear. When, the, when some sound waves stimulate the nervous system at the ear, then there arises, there arises what we call ear consciousness, the mental um, knowing that the ear is stimulated. The physical stimulation stimulates the mind and the mind is conscious of some sound. 
Now this just happens naturally. The sound waves, the nervous system are naturally, naturally existing things. Consciousness arises naturally. It's just how things work. But because of ignorance, we go and misinterpret that consciousness as being I. I hear, I am hearing. Instead of there just being natural hearing, ignorance adds the, the concept of self. It works the same way with the other senses as well. For example, the nose, the nervous system at the nose is stimulated by various volatile gases or smells. And then the tongue is stimulated by tastes, flavors on the taste buds. In both cases, it's just a natural reaction of the, the world against our nervous system. And then we come to the most important of all, the, the sense of touch, the sense of touch in our skin throughout our body. This one is very important because it's being stimulated constantly and some of these stimulations are, are quite powerful. The positives and negatives felt by our body by the sense of touch can be very powerful and are often extremely attractive. And so when the sense of touch is stimulated in some way or another, then very easily ignorance arises. I am touched. I am touching. Through ignorance, the, the illusion of self can come into all of these, all of the senses. They're all the same in that they work naturally. And if ignorance takes over, then all of them will be, the con in each case, the concept of self will arise. Now we come to the most important sense of all, the sixth one, the inner one. From the five outer senses send their, their information or their whatever to the inner sense, the mind or the, the heart. And as soon as the heart or mind receives some sense input from the other senses, then there is feeling. The mind thinks, it interprets, and it does all kinds of things. As soon as the inner sense, the mind, experiences, ordinarily there arises the sense of an experiencer, the one who experiences. You can observe this for yourself because in most cases this is what happens to us, to ordinary people, that whenever there is experience, we create the concept of an experiencer. If there is feeling, there is the one who feels. If there is thought, there is the thinker. Out of all this activity, we create a sense of self. We need to observe this carefully to realize that this concept of self is merely an illusion. It doesn't correspond to any actual reality. When we can see this then, we will have the ability to, to experience without creating this illusion. By understanding how ignorance functions, we can eliminate ignorance so that we no longer create self and selfishness. There was a French philosopher a few hundred years ago who thought, or based on his own thinking, 
the way he thought he experienced things, said, cogito ergo sum, I think, therefore I am. This is an excellent example of, of what we're talking about. <clears throat> because one thinks, because this philosopher was thinking, he, the ordinary sense of self that occurs from ignorance arose. And he took this to be real that because of thought there existed, I exist, I think, therefore I am. So this is an old example of a few hundred years ago, but more than 2,500 years ago, the Buddha was pointing out very clearly that whatever we think to be the self, this concept of self, wherever it may lie, is an illusion created out of our own ignorance. Thinking is just an activity of mind. It's a natural activity. The thinker is an illusion created out of thought. It, the, the thinker, the actor, isn't real. So way before Descartes, the Buddha was teaching this, that what we take to be the self is really not self. That all the possible things that we latch on to as being me is not really me. It's not me, it's not self. But nowadays, still even in this century, few hundred years after Descartes, we still think that I exist. We feel something. I feel we hear something. I hear we think something. I think. Because of ignorance, we take all these natural functions and processes and interpret them as being self. We attach the concept of self to all of these things. Please examine this more and more deeply until you see for yourself that self arises later. It's not something that always existed. It's not some lasting entity. It's just an illusion of thought added to our experience. The more we see this, if we see this clearly enough, then we can live with vicha, knowledge, and panya, wisdom, rather than with avicha, ignorance. When we see that all these things are actually not self, then we can live with wisdom. And when there's this wisdom in, in place of ignorance, then this whole confusion and delusion of self will not occur. Now we'll examine some of the things which tend to be misunderstood, the things that are mistaken to be self. The world is full of such things, things that we misguidedly take to be self. So we'll consider them, we'll break them up into categories and examine them category by category. The first category is what we call the ayatana. Ayatana means things which can be experienced, things which are experienced or can be experienced or things which experience. And this means specifically the eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body, and mind, and the associated nervous system. So the first thing, the first category of things which are taken to be self, 
are the eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body, and mind, the ayatana. So you can see quite clearly that if it wasn't for external sights, sounds, smells, tastes, touches, and thoughts, then there would be no existence of the inner senses, the the eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body, and mind. If there were no sights, sounds, smells, tastes, touches, and thoughts, there's no way that the inner senses, sense organs, could exist. We call the sights, the forms, sounds, smells, tastes, and so on, the external ayatana, the outer things which are experienced by the inner ayatana, the eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body, and mind. Notice that you can't have one without the other. We can have the inner ayatana without the external ayatana. Now it may seem strange to you that this is the place where we we begin our study of Buddhism. This isn't the way people usually begin studying something. But in Buddhism our study begins with just the eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body and mind and the sights, sounds, smells, tastes, touches and thoughts. These are the ABCs of Buddhism. This is where we begin our study. Another thing that will seem strange to you is that in Buddhism we say that the eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body, and mind don't exist all the time. The eyes, etc., are not always here. They don't always exist. Now, this may sound strange to you, so listen carefully. If you can under the more you understand this, the easier it will be for you to understand all of Buddhism. We say the we don't say that the I is always present. But only when the eye performs the function of seeing, only when the, the physical eye is stimulated by some, by some sight or vision, only when it is stimulated into to functioning do we say that the eye exists. So when it functions, we say the eye exists or we say the I arises. When it, that functioning stops, then we say the I ceases. When the I is not functioning, then we say that it does not exist. So the I doesn't exist all the time, it just exists when it is stimulated by, by light, by light waves. And when it isn't stimulated, then it stops functioning. The same is true with the ears when they are stimulated by sound. When they function, when the ear is stimulated so that it functions, meaning performing the, its, its proper function of hearing, then we say the ear exists. When that function ends, then we say the ear ceases. The same is true for the nose when it's stimulated by odors, by the tongue when stimulated by tastes, when the body, the body sense when stimulated by touch. When stimulated, the, each of these senses performs its natural function and we say it exists but then that stimulation doesn't last forever and so we say that that it ceases 
the ear, the nose, the tongue, the body, the mind ceases. This, if you can understand this, will greatly enable, will help you a lot in understanding all of Buddhism. Because we start to see that these things don't exist all the time. They just arise to perform a function and then cease. And so what we take to be some constant existence, when through our ignorance we think that things exist all the time, if we examine them carefully enough, we realize that their existence is only momentary, that instead of some constant steady existence, there is arising and passing away, arising and passing away. They exist to perform a function and then they stop existing. For example, when you're asleep, when you're asleep, your eyes do not perform their function of seeing. The eye, the mind is not consciously seeing anything. And so when we're in deep sleep, the eyes do not exist because they do not perform the activity of seeing. An eye which does not see has no meaning, just as an ear which does not hear or a nose which does not smell. These things are said to exist only when they function. Therefore, when the eye sees something, don't, don't let it become I see. Study this carefully until we realize that it's just the I seeing. This is how things naturally work. It's, there's no me, there's no ego or self that is seeing. In the same way, when the he ear hears a sound, we need to realize that it's just the ear hearing. There's no me or I that hears. When, this, when the nose smells an odor, it's just the nose smelling. There's no I who smells. When the tongue tastes a flavor, see carefully that it's just the tongue tasting. There's no I, me, self, or ego that tastes. These are just the way the nervous system functions. When stimulated, when there is strong enough stimulation, the nervous system experiences something. This happens naturally. It doesn't involve any I or self. When the body, when anywhere over this body is stimulated by some touch, when the sense of touch is stimulated, there's just feeling, there's just tactile feeling. There's no I that feels or me or self. Even the same with the mind. When the mind sense is stimulated by a concept or a memory or something, this is just the way the nervous system and the mind work. There's no self involved. We must, we must learn to, we must study the ayatana, the, the <coughs> senses which experience and the sense objects which are experienced. We must study them in this way to see that they're just natural functions. There's nothing more to them than that. Just natural functions of the nervous system. When we, until we realize that none of it involves any self. Until we stop interpreting all, it all in terms of ignorance. That this is me or this is mine. There are two levels of stupidity that arise here. 
The first kind of stupidity is that I see, I hear, I smell, I taste, I touch, I think. When these natural functions take place, ignorance turns them into I and me. So this turning these things into self or taking them to be self is the first level of, of ignorance. And when we're that ignorant, then we, we, go to, we go to the second level of ignorance, which is to interpret things as mine. My eyes, my ears, my nose, my tongue, my body, my mind. Once the self, the concept of self exists, then the concept of mine, things belonging to self, arises too. There are these two levels of foolishness that occur here. And then this ignorance spreads itself, spreads out all over the place. When there is this ignorant understanding that there is self, then anything that comes into contact with the self is taken to be mine. When we take the eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body, and mind to be self, then whatever is seen, heard, smelled, etc., is taken to be mine. And so this stupidity spreads out, taking over more and more. So please know this first category of things which are taken to be self, taken to be I in mind, the various ayatana. Next we come to the second category which is more subtle than the first. These are what we call the five khanda, the five khanda or aggregates. The five khanda are the are what make up the system of life. The process or system of life is made up of five subsystems. These are the five primary functions that make up the human being. The first is rupa khanda, the body aggregate. Then there is vetana khanda, feeling. Sanya khanda, perception or recognition. Um, Sankara khanda, which is conception or thought. And then Vijnana khanda, consciousness. These, these five activities are the basic functions of life. These are the five subsystems that make up a human being. And they even more, they, they trick us into taking them to be self even more than the ayatana do. These are more, even more easily mistaken to be self than the senses. The first, the first aggregate is the aggregate of rupa or form. This means all the things which have form or shape, all the things that can be seen with the eye. The other four aggregates are arupa, they have no form, they're mental. But the first aggregate are all the material things which have, which have form and for example which can be seen with the eye. This includes our bodies, it includes the objects of sensual experience. This is the, the first aggregate. Next are the four mental aggregates, the or formless aggregates, the aggregates that 
make up the mind. We have to know these very well, very in great detail. The feelings, the perceptions, perceiving something to be this or that, um, thought, conception, and the fourth one is, is consciousness. These four mental aggregates deceive us even more than the ayatana do. They trick us into thinking that they are me or mine quite easily. So it's important to, to know them. <clears throat> now the first khanda, the first aggregate, the aggregate of form, is made up of both, it includes external objects and the internal um, senses, or the inner ayatana and the outer ayatana. So when some form stimulates the nervous system, then there arises the fifth khanda, consciousness, vijnana khanda, the aggregate of consciousness. This consciousness knows the form, whether it's visual or whether it's a sound or whatever. The consciousness aggregate knows, becomes conscious of that form. When conscious, there is consciousness of some, some outer object, depending on the, the sen, one of the senses, we call this patsa or contact. This is where the, the outer object has made an impression on the mind. It's called contact. And when there is contact, there arises the second aggregate feeling. So in short, when, when the inner and outer ayatana interact, such as the eye and a form or the ear and a sound, when they interact, then there arises consciousness. This consciousness of the outer ayatana dependent on the inner ayatana is called contact. And based on that contact, there is feeling. When there is the second khanda, namely vetana, feeling, when this feeling arises, which will be either positive or negative, then there arises the third kanya, kanda, sanya, or, or this one's hard to, to translate, we'll, so we'll explain it. When something is felt, then the mind will recognize it as something, or the mind will classify it. This is what we call sanya. Depending on how it feels, the mind will classify something, will recognize it, perceive it, or regard it. it the, for example, the mind will, re will classify this as positive, this as negative, and something else as negative. This recognition or classification is called sanya. Once something is recognized or classified, the, the mind regards it as really being that. And then there arises the fourth khanda, sankhara khanda, or thought conception. The mind then thinks according to the influence of the recognition. Depending on how something is recognized and classified, the mind then just goes on thinking in that way. This is very important because this is where things are either right or wrong. Because conception is where the concept of self arises. When the mind begins to conceive, 
Ordinarily, it's full. All, our thinking is full of me and mine, and so this is where things can go wrong and end up in dukkha, in pain. But this is also where they can go right. If the thinking is right, if it's not caught up in me and mine, then there won't be any problems. So. Under the influence of recognition and classification, then the mind thinks, and ordinarily it thinks in terms of me and mine. Now please observe these until you see how closely they interact, how these five sub-functions depend on mutually interdependent, that you can't have one without, or each functions dependent on the others. It begins with rupa khanda, the senses and the forms in the world. This stimulates consciousness, vijnana khanda. When there is then contact the feeling khanda arises. When something is felt, then it is recognized and classified, which is sanya khanda. And then last, when something is recognized and classified, it's thought about, which is sankara khanda. Each they arise in this sequentially, like this, and they depend on each other in this way. When you see more and more clearly how these five different functions function together, how you see how they are interdependent, then you realize more and more how there's none of them are a self and that there's no need for a self. When we see how these naturally work together, we can see how a human being, a human life, can function without any need for some, some self, some ego. None of these needs to be taken as me or mine, because they naturally function on their own together. But because it's one after the other, after the other, after another, you can't take any one of these as being a self. You can't take them all together as a self or separately as being self. If we observe these five khandas throughout the day, we'll see that an in any moment, there is one of them operating, that there isn't any moment of life when one of the khandas isn't operating. And, but we'll also see that they don't occur simultaneously. They, they occur, they function sequentially, one after the other. As we watch them functioning throughout the day, we see more and more how this happens naturally and how that none of them need be or can be taken as me or mine, as being self. We see how the rupakanda, the form, the aggregate of form, functions. We watch it function. We see the feelings, the perceptions, the recognitions sanya khanda, the thoughts of sankara khanda and the consciousness of vijnana khanda. See how one follows the other over and over again until we see more and more how human life is. The more we see this, the more we are able to look at life as being not self, we, um, and then we don't turn life into any problems or difficulties.
This is something we should observe <clears throat> very carefully throughout the day until we know these five khandas as well as we know the things in our houses. All the stuff in our house we tend to know quite well. We need to know these khandas even more than that, even more subtly. Because each of them is inviting us, deceiving us, <clears throat> into taking them as being self. So we need to know them well enough that we're no longer tricked by them. The first category of things which trick us into thinking they are me and mine are the ayatana, the inner senses in the outer sense objects. Then the second category of things which deceive us into thinking they are me and mine are the five khandas. The third category is what we call dependent origination. This is the most subtle and deceptive of all. Dependent origination is the English translation of the word Baticha Samupada or in Thai Baticha Samupada. This is an activity or reality that's of the mind which is always present. A constant process of dependent origination is occurring within the mind, or we could say the mind is this process of dependent origination. This is going on all the time and so it can deceive us unless we see it very carefully. When we talk about this flow or process of dependent origination, we can speak of 12 conditions or 12 symptoms of this, of this flow. These are the 12 conditions or the 12 links of dependent origination. It begins with the ayatana, the inner senses and the outer sense objects. When these come together and interact, then there arises consciousness or vijnana. This is where dependent origination starts, right here at this meeting of the ayatana and the arising of consciousness. We need to observe these and know them until we realize that none of them are self. The inner ayatana, the outer ayatana are not self. This consciousness which arises is not self. To see all of these, whatever is happening, as not self. Now when these, these three things we just mentioned meet together or happen together, when the inner ayatana, the outer ayatana, and the consciousness, when these three meet, there occurs what we call pasa, or we call this meeting of the ayatana in consciousness pasa, contact. Contact is where the experience impresses itself on the mind, on consciousness. This is also not self. This is, these are natural functions, these Things occur naturally working together. There is contact arising out of this natural process, but this contact is not self. 
when there is contact, then there certainly will be something coming. And what comes after contact is feeling. Whenever there is contact, the mind will feel some way about that contact or experience. When contact is not self, then feeling is also not self. Feeling is just a reaction to the contact. It's nothing more. So there's no way that we can take feeling as being me or mine. When feeling arises, there will arise what we a desire, a wanting. When feeling is positive, there will be a certain kind of desire. Desire will go in one direction. When feeling is negative, then desire will go in another direction. But here, this desire is always ignorant. The desire we're talking about now is just foolish desire or craving. We're not talking about the want that comes from wisdom, from correct understanding. That's called aspiration or aim. But here, when the mind has been conditioned into feeling positive or negative, then it will desire according to that feeling. Now, this feeling, this ignorant feeling or dhanha, is also not self. It's based on things which are not self. And although it thinks in a way that creates a sense of self, it is not in itself self. This desire cannot properly be taken as me or mine. This point is very dangerous. We need to be very careful. It's very easy to take desire as being self. We need to watch it very carefully to, to be aware that it is not self. Feelings, these feelings, positive and negative, are just illusory, and they condition the desire. If this is the case, the desire doesn't have any lasting reality in itself. It's just a passing phenomena. But if we're not careful, we'll make the mistake of Descartes. Once there is desire, once there is experience, feeling, will think, because I can desire, I am. Desire is just a kind of thinking. If I think, therefore I am, I desire, therefore I am. This is the common assumption we make. So we must be very careful here to see that desire is just a natural reaction to feeling. When the mind is, is functioning ignorantly, desire is the natural consequence of feeling. Seeing this, we need not take it to be a real self. Now we come to the most important and dangerous step, which is that tanha, desire or craving, conditions upadana, upadana or attachment. Attachment is where the mind grasps, clings, clutches. It reaches out and grabs onto and then clutches at something. It attaches to the, when there is desire, when the mind has been conditioned by desire, the mind, then upadana, attachment, will attach to the desirer, the thing that supposedly desires. It will, it will attach to the object of the desire. It will attach to the, the fruits or whatever we think we're going to get from the object of desire. Desire conditions grasping, clinging, clutching in this way. If, and even this attachment, is not self. 
it's merely an a ignorant it's merely a conditioned reaction when there is attachment then there is bawa bawa or in Thai pop which can be translated existence so when there is attachment there is existence but although this word means existence it doesn't mean any it doesn't mean full complete real existence it's just the beginning of existence so sometimes it's translated becoming it's like conception when there's a for a pregnancy to begin there must be conception bhava is like this conception which begins a pregnancy so due to attachment there is this existence when the fetus in the womb once the fetus is conceived then it grows and develops until one day the fetus is mature enough to be born in the same way bhava is the basis for jati which means birth but here we don't mean physical birth as with the example of the the fetus and child here we mean a mental birth of what is called ego of me mine dependent on bhava the sense of self grows until it is born as a complete i am a complete ego the mind now is fully dominated by i by ego even this birth of of self of ego is not self it's merely it's merely concocted this is conditioned concocted by the process that we've been describing it doesn't have any independent existence or reality that we could call a self even birth is not self this ego is delusive it's delusive ego it arises out of ignorance confusion delusion so it is delusive it's an illusive ego this ego doesn't it's created from the imagination it doesn't have any real it doesn't have any reality to it it's just an illusion a mental image so we say this ego is both delusive and elusive it's not self now when the ego is born when this ego is born it rakes in everything that comes into contact with it as being mine once there is this me anything that associates with it or is has anything to do with it is taken to be mine this is how the ignorant mind functions for example when there is ego then this ego will attach to physical birth the fact that one has been born this physical birth will be attached to as my birth any illness sickness or pain will be attached to as my illness my sickness my pain aging becomes my aging i'm getting old death becomes my death i will die all the things associated with the ego are then taken to be mine wealth possessions money jewels fame honor status husbands wives children 
house, home, car, pets, everything associated with this ego becomes mine. So can you see the ego is carrying around all this, all this stuff? The ego doesn't do anything except carry around all these burdens. So we call all these, we call this the burden of life. The only thing the ego does is carry around this heavy load because everything that comes into contact with it is taken to be mine. Now this ego itself or all the things that are attached to as mine as belonging to the ego, all of these are still not self. All of the things in this process of dependent origination that we've been discussing are not self. None of them exist in any way that could be considered, could be rightly considered a self. Ego is not self. All the things that are taken to be mine are not self. To remember all this, we can express it in just one sentence. Please try and remember this sentence. The ego or self is the one that carries the burdens. The ego is the carrier of all burdens. Whether we're speaking of the ayatana, inner and outer, or the five khandas, or whatever, the ego carries all these, all these things around as a burden. Because of ego, all these things become heavy loads. We can just, to make it even simpler, we can just say life. Ego is what carries the burden of life. But when there's no ego, there's no burdens. When there's no ego to carry around all these heavy weights, there's no burden. That means there's no suffering. So ego is the carrier of the burdens. No ego, no burden. One more sentence. The final goal of the most excellent life is to throw away the ego. The most beneficial, the most useful and advantageous thing we can do in life is to take the ego and throw it away. This is the final goal of the most excellent life. So the ego is what carries the burdens of life. The ego is what makes life into a burden. If there was no ego, life would not be a problem. Life would not have <clears throat> any problems. When there is, whether it's positive, a positive ego or a negative ego, whether it attaches in a positive way or a negative way, all of these are still burdens. Positive things are burdensome in one way. Negative things are burdensome in another way. But it's all heavy and painful nonetheless. Therefore, the one who is doesn't give any meaning to positive and negative is one who doesn't feel any burdens. As long as we still take things to be positive and negative, then these things will become burdensome. But when the one whose mind is above all positive and negative, that one is free. That person doesn't carry, that one, that mind doesn't carry 
and he burns. Something that is very difficult to see and understand is that the positive ego is just as burdensome and painful as the negative ego. Because all of us want a positive ego, a good ego. We live in a world that is infatuated with the positive, that worships the positive. And so it's very difficult for us to see that the positive ego is just as burdensome as negative ego. One way to help you see how heavy the good positive ego is, is, for example, laughter. If you, if you laughed all day long from dawn to dusk, it would probably kill you. Or if you were happy all day long, then you wouldn't even be able to go to sleep. If you observe things like laughter and happiness, which people want so badly and worship so highly, if you look at them honestly, you'll see that these aren't really natural, healthy, or even sane then you'll see then you'll see why we say that even the positive ego is a burden if we can look at this more and more carefully clearly honestly then we have the potential of getting free as long as we're trapped in ego as long as we're carrying around these burdens then life is painful. But when we let go of ego, when we, when we understand what's being talked about and let go of ego, then life is free. This is what we call liberation or salvation. So observe things very carefully. Notice, if you watch carefully, you, for example, you see that there are only very few moments when the mind is free. There aren't that many moments when the mind is free of ego. There are occasional lapses or pauses where the mind is void of ego. But dependent origination is always waiting around to, to stir up the mind. As long as there is ignorance, the mind is always spinning around in this cycle of dependent origination. And so almost all the time, there is, the mind is being conditioned by ego. There is some form of ego. This can even happen while we're asleep. We can dream in egoistic ways. But if, if we observe this more and more carefully until we see this truth, then we have the potential to, to get free. When we really see this thoroughly, then we can drop it and be free. When we see the heaviness and the painfulness of the positive and the negative and the egos that ensue, then we can step back, step out, and be free. But if we don't see this, if we don't observe how the ego is there almost all the time, then we have no, no chance of getting free. There is one sentence which is very easy to say, but very difficult to understand and realize. The sentence is, we are caught in the prison of ego all the time. We are trapped in the prison of ego all the time. It's a very simple sentence, easy to say, but it's very difficult to understand. 
its meaning is very profound. We are caught in the prison of ego all the time. If we can understand this, or we, we must understand this, we must examine it more and more deeply until we understand it, until we see the great imperative to get free, until all we're asking is how to get free of this prison. And then, then we must try to keep trying until we do get free of this prison of ego. We are trapped in the prison of ego all the time. The practice of anapanasati, mindfulness with breathing, is the only way that's going to get us out of this prison of ego. To practice anapanasati is the, the best way to get free of the ego prison. If we practice mindfulness with breathing correctly and sufficiently, then we will see that the ayatana are not self. The five khandas are anatta, not self. We'll see that all the links and conditions of the process of dependent origination are not self. When we see that all of these things are not self, then we will know how to deal with all the experiences of life. We won't fall into the, the illusion of positive and negative. So please do your best to practice mindfulness with breathing so that we see that everything is not self that we will escape from the prison of ego. Through anapanasati, we will be able to deal correctly with dependent origination. So you've been practicing anapanasati now for over a week. You've been practicing it. You should know how to practice. So keep on practicing, continue to develop this until we realize the truth of not-self. Keep practicing anapanasati until anatta or not-self becomes absolutely clear. And then we will escape from the prison of ego. Thank you for being good listeners. We'll end, this is all for today's talk.